My name is Todd Presner. I'm a professor here in the Germanic Languages Department and also the director of our Center for Jewish Studies. And this is uh, the third day that we're hosting Li Hong Song from the University of Nanjing. And we're really delighted about the opportunity to hear more about his extraordinary research and engage with um, Chinese research on Jewish studies topics. I should say that today's talk is co-sponsored by a number of units on campus, and this has really been a very exciting collaborative venture that we've just really embarked on this uh, school year. We have the UCLA Department of History, the Confucius Institute, the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, East Asian Language, East Asian Library, and the Center for Chinese Studies as co-sponsors of this series of events. I should also say that we have an ongoing uh, commitment uh, to bring scholars from China to, the, to UCLA. In fact, another event will be taking place in April uh, with uh, one of Li Hong's um, colleagues coming to UCLA, sponsored by the History Department. And we also have a major exhibition that we're planning for a year from now, for the fall of 2013, uh, on the Jews of Shanghai. So this is an ongoing commitment and interest that we're exploring. Um, many of you have met our speaker already uh, at other events, but for those of you who haven't, I do want to say a few words of introduction. Uh, Li Hong uh, Song is the Deputy Director of the Glaser Institute of Jewish Studies at Nanjing University. He's also a professor in the Department of Religious Studies, uh, where he's been since 2003. Um, he's currently based in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania's um, at the Katz Institute uh, for Advanced Judaic Studies. And he's here in the United States for the year doing his own research on a forthcoming book, pub book publication. Today's talk, Chinese and Western perspective, Perspectives on the Jewish Community in Kaifeng Toward a Fusion of Horizons uh, is the title of the talk today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Li Hong Song. Thank you. and to uh, Center for Chinese Studies, uh, Jewish Studies, uh, to bring me to here. <coughs> uh, today I will continue my uh, last night's nice talk, uh, but it's uh, focused on a uh, case study. You know, China is the only country in the Far East in which Jews have continuously lived for over 1,000 years. From the 11th century on, an indigenous Jewish community existed in the city of Kaifeng in central China. Now this is a map of China and uh, Kaifeng located here. Uh, here. <clears throat> the Kaifeng was an important entrepot uh, on the Silk Road and was the Chinese capital of northern Song Dynasty. Uh, it is believed the largest city in the world at the time. Now, I will show you a Qingming scroll. It's one of the most famous paintings you know, ever produced in ancient China. It portrayed a panorama of the daily life in Kaifeng in its prime. So living in such a metropolis, it largely cut off from uh, contact with the main centers of Jewish life. Uh, the Kaifeng Jews developed a distinctive culture that was unquestionably Jewish but progressively absorbed Chinese elements, such as women's binding of feet and taking of the second wives. Uh, their greatest problem was not so much separation from other Jews as the openness of the Chinese society. Intermarriage occurred frequently, and Jews were fully accepted as merchants, government <coughs> officials, and neighbors. From the mid-19th century on, they were so completely assimilated that few of their descendants today carry any memory of Jewish liturgy and are physically indistinguishable from other Chinese. But interestingly, it was an Italian Jesuit priest, Matteo Ricci, you know, who discovered these Jews and made them widely known uh, in Europe. In, 19, uh, in 1605, shortly after his establishment in Beijing, Ritchie, uh, the founder of the Christian mission in China, had a visit from an elderly man called uh, Ai Tian from the Jewish community of Kaifeng. You know, Ai Tian had heard 
about newly arrived Westerners in Beijing who believed in one God. After an ambiguous conversation, Richie found ITM was a Jew, and ITM realized that Richie was not a Jew, but adhered to another faith he had never heard about. Richie then sent two converts Chinese to Kaifeng to look into the matter. Today, owing to the efforts of the Jesuit fathers, we still have some of the earliest drawings about the community. You know, this is a reading uh, the Torah at the synagogue of Kaifeng. The original drawing was made by a French Jesuit who visited the synagogue in 1722. Uh, the father obviously had no artistic training. A somewhat more competent draftsman, another Jesuit, subsequently reworked it. However, he made two important improvements or embellishments. Uh, first, he improved the original by straightening the noses. You can, you can compare this, straightening the noses. Second, and uh, he put shoes on the feet of the three worshippers. The latter, at least, was inaccurately done. In ancient Kaifeng, Jews lived in the Muslim area and was adopted some Muslim practices, as is well known. Muslim worship barefooted. Now, now these are the uh, drawings about the exterior and interior of the synagogue. Now, interestingly, uh, the synagogue at the time was called Qingzhenzi, in Chinese means mosque. Um, now later on, the emperor in China banned Christianity and deported almost all missionaries to Macau. That ended the contact between Kaifeng Jews and the Catholicism. It was not until the mid-19th century, after the Opium War, whereby China was forced to surrender to the Western colonial powers, that the community revived its connection to the West, this time not exclusively to the Catholic orders, but to Protestants of various denominations as well. Today, about 120 descendants, residents of Kaifen trace their lineage to this community. They have reconnected to the mainstream Jewry. Now, with the help of the Jewish and Christian organizations, some members of the community have emigrated to Israel. Now, this is a model of the synagogue. And these, these are the Jewish descendants of Kaifen. Uh, this girl uh, from Kaifen, 18 years old, holding her official conversion certificate from the chief rabbinate in Israel, together with the director and the educator of her community in Haifa. That's 2004. Now, above is a brief sketch of the story of Kaifeng Jews. So ever since its discovery uh, by Matteo Ricci, the community has triggered off legions of scholarly activity. This is really surprising, because the primary source is a few and far between, and seems not very you know, promising for a sustainable project. You know, the most important sources are three you know, stellar inscriptions in Chinese, that commemorate various rebuildings of the synagogue and contain quite detailed accounts of the origins, history, and beliefs of the Kaifeng Jews. You know, these are ink rubbings of the two uh, stelae, you know, which are still existent. Extent. Uh, there's also an archive including uh, certain Torah scrolls. Most of them are housed at the Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College right now. And two Haggadot's and some memorial books and artifacts. Now, for example, this one. Uh, this Torah stroll uh, was being, a, 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 may have been made in the middle of the uh, 17th century, now at the British Library. Uh, these, you know, now this is a Torah case from the synagogue in Kaifeng. Uh, this is a black trade that was used to call the Jews of Kaifeng for worship. Now, uh, these artifacts are uh, at the Royal Ontario Museum of Canada. And uh, this is a page uh, in the Register of Women. It's a, you know, part of the memorial book, both Chinese and Hebrew. 
Now, before I continue, I must mention an egregiously eye-catching paper. You know, the author from School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London argued the Kaifeng community was a pure Western invention. After reading it, I was shocked. You know, the argument was completely based on the correspondence and reports of the Christian missionaries in China, as if those inscriptions and artifacts I just mentioned never exist. You know, this blind spot is too huge to believe. You know, who's, you know, the, the historical authenticity of those artifacts and ins inscriptions have never been challenged by competent epigraphists in China and in the United States. Uh, by the way, uh, though uh, when exactly Jews arrived in China is di disputed among scholars, you know, two documents written by Jewish merchants in Judo Persia, that is Persia language written in Hebrew script, were unearthed in Dandan Urik, you know, that's a small community near Silk Road uh, uh, in Xinjiang, or in English, probably you call East Turkestan. Till now, the most reliable evidence for the earliest arrival of Jews in China, you know, these documents were dated in the uh, turn of the 7th and 9th century. It should be pointed out that the colophon uh, to the Pentateuch of the Kaifeng Jews were also in Judo Persia. I don't think the Jesuit fathers you know, had the leisure or competence to forge Judo Persia documents. You know, they had more important you know, mission in China to do. <laughs> the Zhou Xin published an excellent book on Chinese perceptions of Jews in modern period. I think he's a, you know, very, she's a very fine scholar. I think it's unthinkable she doesn't know the existence of these primary sources. So I don't know why she wrote this article. It's a mystery for me. Now, if we compare the works by Chinese and Western scholars, a most profound difference in terms of epistemology and motivation will stand out in bold relief. Now, as mentioned above, the modern awareness of Kaifeng Jewry has much to do with its context with Christian missionaries. You know, for this reason, the religious perspective dominates the scholarship in Western languages. For Christians, the Kaifeng Jewry was important in two ways. On the one hand, the Torah scroll possessed by the community kindled the Christian hope of finding an original text of the Bible. You know, since adjusting art of the second century, Christian theologians had long insisted that the verses of the Hebrew Bible prophesying the coming of Christ had been tempered with by the rabbis of the Talmudic era, surmising that the Kaifen scriptures might have been produced before the compilation of Talmud. They anticipated that by comparing a Torah scroll from Kaifen with the standard Hebrew text at the Europe then, they would be able to find the definitive evidence for the rabbi's falsification. The Ritchie soon found the Bible from Kaifen was almost identical with the standard Hebrew text in Europe. On the other hand, investigating Kaifen jury was also involved in the famous Chinese rights controversy within the Catholic Church from the 1680s till early you know, 18th century. Unlike their fellow clergymen in the American continent, the European missionaries in China were confronted with a highly sophisticated and illiterate society. They had to weigh these questions. Was it imperative for the church to make concessions with regard to the ritual and the liturgy, thereby acclimatizing the Christian faith to the time-honored religious practices in China? How was it possible to translate monasticistic ideas into Chinese without offending the native sensibilities. Now, the Jesuits, led by Matteo Ricci, were quite open as they sought to create a Chinese version of Christianity instead of trying to replicate a European church. At first, Ricci and his associates believed that Buddhism was the ranking religion. So they shaved their heads and donned the brown robes of the local monks. After learning the local language, however, they discovered that the Buddhists were not held in high esteem 
by the majority of Chinese. You know, with this realization, they began to adopt a dress and comportment of local Confucian elites. You know, this is a you know, painting shown Matteo Ricci in the robe of Confu Confucian elites. It's in blue, not in brown. Uh, in addition, they permitted the Chinese converts to continue to attend traditional Chinese rites. You know, the Confucius worship and the ancestor walk veneration in particular. For they argued these rites were just the social or civic ceremonies. Now this attitude, however, came to be criticized by the rival you know, missionary orders, especially the Dominicans, which had started their own missionary work in China. Now often coming from the Spanish colony of the Philippine, Philippines, they rejected, you know, these Dominicans rejected any adaptation to local customs and wished to apply in China the same tabula rasa principle they had applied in other places. So they were horrified by the practices of the Jesuits, hence the genesis of a prolonged debate in Europe. In this bitter and often you know, ignoramious fight, every kind of argument was used by both sides. The jury of Kaifeng, harmonious with the Chinese society, while still sticking to the monotheistic belief, could be viewed as a frame of reference for gorging the extent to which Christianity could be acculturated. You know, if Kaifeng Jews accepted the traditional Chinese rites as civic ones, and if they used the same Chinese words for God as the Jesuits, they would bolster the Jesuits' cause. And in fact they did. But before the Jesuits' investigation report you know, reached the road, the Pope Clement XI you know, had decided in favor of the Dominicans. His decision eventually reached to the Emperor Kangxi in China, who was pissed off and decreed that, you know, to quote, it's impossible to reason with them because they do not understand the larger issues as we understand them in China. I have never seen a document which contains so much nonsense. From now on, Westerners should not be allowed to preach in China to avoid further trouble." End of quote. So basically, it was a dialogue, to use the Chinese saying, between chicken and duck. <laughs> so in short, the knowledge about the Kaifeng Jews was valuable in so far as it could be utilized for Christian polemics and proselytizing. So Christians pioneered the study of you know, Kaifeng community. By contrast, both Chinese and Jewish scholars came to the field very late. Chen Yuan, you know, China's foremost authority on the history of religions, produced a groundbreaking and still fundamental study in the 1920s. He checked the names in various local documents and gazetteers against those names inscribed on the stila inscriptions, thereby laying a solid philological foundation for all subsequent studies in Chinese. You know, the study was conducted in a subtle and exhaustive way that any further significant progress along this line of thought would be extremely painstaking. The reason is straightforward. The authors of classical Chinese literary texts didn't distinguish Jews from the devotees of Islam and attempted to lump them together. All foreigners from Central Asia and Middle East were loosely termed people with colored eyes. For example, the Nestorians, the first Christians in China, were called the people with blue eyes. So in other words, there was no separate official category for Jews in ancient China. For that reason, were it not for those names engraved on the stila, it would have been impossible to identify who was Jewish in Chinese historical literature. So who is Jew? It's also a solid question in classical China. <laughs> so mostly alien to the missionary mindset and discourse, Chinese scholars are inclined to pay close attention to Kaifeng Jews' social interaction with the host culture, almost without exception. They are intrigued by the central question of why the Kaifeng Jews were eventually assimilated. The reasons have frequently been ascribed to three major elements.
first religious tolerance. And according to one Chinese scholar, to quote, no sources can prove that Taiwan Jews were ever subjected to persecution. Under such tolerant and peaceful circumstances, the cohesion of the Taiwan Jewish community was gradually relaxed. We can hardly find in the world a country besides China where toleration of Jews lasted for so long. This should be one of the main reasons for the assimilation of the Kaifen Jews. The second you know, reason uh, can be ascribed to intermarriage. The third one, that's equal opportunity, especially in taking part in the imperial examination whereby government officials were selected. You know, a skewed mastery of Confucius classics was indispensable to anyone who sought to get a good score in this examination. You know, there are, in ancient China, there are only two uh, imperial examination sites, one in Beijing, the other in Nanjing. Uh, each examinee occupied a cell like this. Uh, however, not everyone was good at memorizing those you know, Confucian classics. The, these mini books for cheating used in the exam <laughs> testify to the fact that learning Confucius classics was so time consuming that it means an abandonment of Hebrew learning. Increasing numbers of Kaifen Jews were appointed to office, a few to quite high positions. They came under the sway of Confucian teachings which in turn influenced the entire uh, Jewish community. The Jew who met Mattel Ritchie in Beijing had forgotten Hebrew language because he devoted to learning the Confucian classics since childhood. So in short, all three reasons give evidence to the irresistible charm of the Chinese culture and the traditional magnanimity of the Chinese people, according to Chinese scholars. However, this master narrative of Assimilation remains virtually impervious to Jewish scholars who seem to opt for a discourse of survival. Instead of asking why did the Chinese Jews you know, not survive, they prefer to address how did they manage to survive so long? What the record of Haifan Jewry persisting for over 40 generations shows is that China is very slow in absorbing its minorities. The question for assimilation may be better understood as the example of creative culture interaction than a simple submission to the norms of the majority culture. Now, this is the opinion of Professor Andrew Plax, a very distinguished sinologist, Jewish sinologist at Princeton. But I would hasten to add that culture pluralism is the norm in the United States. And according to Irene Eber, the founding mother of the Department of East Asia Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, even the concept of assimilation itself seems irrelevant in analyzing the gradual adaptation of customs from the Chinese environment that led not to disappearance, but to the retaining of Jewish identity for over 800 years. So in her opinion, the Jewish diaspora in China underscores the importance of institutional life in the preservation and perpetuation of Jewish values and, and demonstrates a variety of Jewish secular culture in the assertion of Jewish identity. As one of the hidden children, Eber also penned a moving memoir recording her survival through the Holocaust. So how to evaluate the Jewish diaspora in China? What kind of significance can be gleaned from this story, the efforts of the Jewish sinologists notwithstanding. The Jewish historian, you know, uh, these questions uh, seem difficult for the mainstream general Jewish historians. In their voluminous histories of the Jewish people, Heinrich Gries, the Jewish historian of 19th century, and Simon Dubnov, the foremost Jewish historian of early 20th century, didn't even mention Kaifen. These are enormously erudite scholars. It's unthinkable they had never heard of Kaifen Jewry. They ignored, ignored them simply because they saw no historic and cultural significance in an isolated, marginal, and eventually disappeared community. Now, both, of the, uh, both of them were living in an age bearing 
witness to the nationalism at its peak. For them, the aim of the Jewish historiography was to record the longevity, resistance, and vitality of the Jews. Any stories in the Jewish history that contravenes this aim should be denounced or ignored. Now, Grace himself hates assimilation in particular. The confronted with assimilation rampant among the German Jews of his generation, he once made a malicious verdict on the Jewish Salon woman in Old Berlin, you know, commenting on Henrietta Hertz, Rachel van Hagen. You know, he said, these talented but sinful women did Judaism a service by becoming Christians. <laughs> so as for the remote Kaifen jewelry, they simply belong to the category of Dominatio Memoria. Eration of memory. So the first comprehensive historian of the Jews who devoted a whole chapter to Kaifen Jew was Salom Baron in 1983. In the last volume of his Martin, Martin Opus, A Social and Religious History of the Jews, Kaifen Jewry appeared as appendix. Well, Baron's description didn't go beyond a small factual observation. In other general works of Jewish history, the Kaifen Jewry usually enjoyed an exotic place and was treated in parallel to the Jews of India and Ethiopia. Again, the significance of Kaifen never goes beyond the local history. Here mention must be made of a radical interpretation which was put forward not by a historian of the Jewish people, but by perhaps the greatest Jewish historian of Islam, Bernard Lewis. In his view, Jews in the diaspora could flourish and continue an original, meaningful religious and cultural life only under the aegis of one of the two daughter religions, Christianity and Islam. In other words, without the stimulus that Christianity or Islam had offered, the Jewish life would have doomed to stagnate. According to Lewis, the Jews in China and India vividly validate his observation. <coughs> You know, if, if Herodotus was the father of history, the fathers of meaning in history were the Jews, says you know, the late great Columbia professor Yerushami. Now, obviously, the history of Kaifen Jews was not a bowl of nourishing chicken soup for Jewish historians, <laughs> but it is for Chinese historians. We should bear in mind that Chinese research on Kaifen Jews didn't begin until the eve of 20th century, when the gate of Central Kingdom, the literal meaning of China, had been caned into pieces by Western colonial powers. The leading modern Chinese historians were confronted by the challenges of modernity in general and of how to adjust the very best of Chinese traditional scholarship to the Western paradigm in particular. A product of his time, Chen Yuan, you know, impresses today's readers with his delight in facts and his objective, exhaustive, and rigorous style. Yet this seemingly impersonal, positivist, positivistic uh, scholarship was motivated by an indispensable inner feeling for his subject, the fervently wishing to see the center of sinology return from Paris or Tokyo back to Beijing. He used to deplore in class that the arrival and each and every new book on the history of China written by a foreign scholar was tantamount to blast of a bomb at his desk. <laughs> so contemporaneous with his, with his study of Kaifen community, he also produced an internationally acclaimed monograph on the transformation of numerous foreign groups into Chinese from uh, 13th through 14th century, when China was under the rule of Mongols. You know, about this monograph, the Chen Yuan disclosed in his old age that it was composed at a moment when the Chinese were least respectable and the claim to wholesale westernization was put forward by some. So with a penetrating vision, he saw in the ancient assimilation story of foreign immigrants, the Kaifen jury included, a spur to awaken the national confidence and a stimulus to revitalize Chinese culture when it was at its nadir. So this ESOP set the tone for almost all subsequent studies in this field in China, as an ethnic historian remarking 
1983. Generosity, open-mindedness, recognition and reward of merit, fair and equal treatment, these are traditions we must continue to foster and develop, for in world history, they are too rare. Now, its latest reincarnation runs as follows. The Kaifeng Jews had gradually weakened their Jewish identity without any pressure from the outside world and identified highly with Confucianism. So above, I give a brief survey of the Christian, Jewish, and Chinese perspectives on the Jewish communities in China, in Kaifeng. So it's interesting to know that working on the same historical evidence, Chinese and Western scholars usually drew drastically different conclusions. You know, my reflections on the differences have, I hope, shed some light on the different worlds in which we live and lead. You know, to juxtapose these interpretations may help us realize that for a given group at a given time, to make this or that mode of interpreting the claimed tradition, be it Chinese or Jewish, is opt for a particular way of relating themselves to their historical past and social present. Thank you. the opportunity to ask questions and I will um, help to field those. So, um, you know, start in the back. Uh, I'll try to speak up. Hello, um, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating lecture. I'm, I'm really enjoyed every second of it. Um, so you alluded to several reasons why um, uh, the, the Jewish community in China um, managed to weave itself into the uh, population by some, and yet somehow keeping forms of Jewish identity last for generations, and it, and you can see a contrast here to Jew, other Jewish communities. But I'm, I'm wondering about whether this we can take the uh, uh, language of experimental sciences to think that this that that, that, that this is, could be a control group where Judaism was embedded in, in a religious environment that was not theologically uh, bound to uh, Islam and Christianity, both for Abrahamic religions, have this uh, uh, relationship ambiguous with Judaism. And uh, so I was wondering what is maybe the theological uh, um, uh, precepts that the Jews in China uh, were surrounded by that, that could also I can also rephrase if people weren't able to hear. Yeah. So, just, uh, just briefly, I just want to provide interpretation. We don't have a, a microphone for the audience. So it was the question of what were the particular theological precepts or reasons that might explain the trajectory of the Jews in Kaifun uh, in their long, somewhat long-term assimilation process. Were there theological pressures from the outside? Is that what you're saying that yes. contributed to this? Yes, I mean, because it would definitely contrast with Christianity and Islam, where the majority of Jews uh, live. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, you know, Jews are you know called people of the book, you know, the, the, the Tanakh, the Bible. You know, it's very important for them. And these, I think, the, the Jewish identity is actually structured around their, you know. Uh, around uh, reading the Tanakh, that's the most important. You know, I think this is the most important reason why they, uh, they they kept their identity for such a long time. But sadly, you know, uh, these uh, the Kaifeng community never uh, translated the Bible into Chinese. So when the Kangxi, you know, uh, dispelled all those you know uh, missionaries. You know, Christianity of Christians or Jew, or Jewish, you know, foreigners, foreign rabbis couldn't come into you know Kaifeng, so they lost uh, uh, their language skill. So that's a reason, probably. They eventually assimilated into Chinese, you know, society. That's a reason. Go in the back. I actually want to push that question. 
with a little, with a, because I, I formulate it a little bit differently. The, the problem for Judaism, as contra Lewis in a way, I is that contrary to, to Lewis's assertion that Judaism would only thrive in, in, with, in the context of Christianity uh, and Islam, uh, I mean, I'm not exactly that, but, but it, it distinct from Lewis, is that the problem for Judaism amidst Christianity and Islam is monotheism. And that monotheism breeds intolerance. Uh, whereas, the, perhaps, I mean, this was the explanation that's missing here, that there was no theological intolerance in China that could breed that form of oppression. Um, and, and, no, and no foundational myth as there is in Christianity and even slightly in Islam that would implicate the Jews in any way and, and bring about a sustained hatred. Now to that extent, you have a similar experience in India, in parts of India, where there was no uh, uh, theological sustained uh, his, history of hatred that was built into the religious system. Yeah, so my understanding is, you know, the tolerance is totally an idea, you know, alien to traditional China. We don't have, you know, an idea of tolerance in China. This is the you know, European coinage, you know, in the way, you know, John Locke, you know, that's, and, and to my Chinese sensibility, you know, it's, it has a, you know, very patronizing and <laughs> overtone. You know, in China, we have, you know, you know the Confucius idea, you know, how many without conformity, is enshrined in our, you know, you know, in our classics. That doesn't mean, you know, we don't have, you know, prejudice or bias. We call, you know, the ancient Chinese call, you know, those, you know, uh, non-hand barbarians. But once they adopted Chinese, speak, you know, spoke Chinese language, they, you know, they were regarded as Chinese. You know. Yes. Um, <coughs> China is officially still a Marxist state. Marx was of Jewish descent. You have almost a messianic uh, movement in Marxism. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a secular Jewish uh, substrate to all of Marxism. How do the Chinese deal with it? Is there any recognition of Marx as, in a sense, a Jewish prophet in China? You know, as I said in my last talk, you know, Marx is widely regarded as Jewish in China. You know, although he converted to Christianity around seven, seven, seven age, right? Well, seven his father, years his old, father was his father, yeah. yeah. But it's, but you know, it's, yes, it's 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 widely regarded. You know. The Jews and left, you know, many, you know, Russian you know, revolutionary leaders, like Tolstoy's, Tolstoy, you know, Lenin, is regarded, you know, are regarded as Jewish in China. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, so we have over a billion Jews in China then. <laughs> Identified highly with Confucianism. Um, I know Confucianism is not a religion, correct? But what in the code and teachings would have been very compatible with Jewish teachings? Interesting question. Very good question. You know, there's a, a prolonged debate in, in China whether uh, Confucianism is a religion or not. As far as I know, there's also a prolonged, a prolonged debate among you know Jewish scholars whether Judaism is a religion or not. You know, we are probably you know the religion, the idea of religion, to my understanding, is probably you know it's a Christian idea. You know, it's a religion. What is religion? You know? And, and Confucianism, to somewhat, you know, somewhat similarly to Judaism, is like a way of life. It's a way of life. So, and, and some, you know, the Confucius ideal is simply, you know, was simply enshrined by the Kaifeng community. Let's go back to the point. Is uh, in, in the documentation that exists. Is there any information of when the Jews actually came to Kaifeng, how and why? 
No. There's, uh, there's no definitive you know, evidence for that question because the three uh, inscriptions they recorded three different, three different periods. Very, uh, so there's a debate, but it, it's, it's, it's widely believed that around you know, 100 and you know, 1,011, you know, 1,100 years, there is a, a, a sizable, there was a sizable uh, local Jewish community in Kaifen. But where, to, to which route they came to Kaifen, we don't have ev you know, hard evidence for that. You know, some argue uh, they uh, came from, you know, through Silk Road. You know, some argue they uh, came from, you know, sea routes through Indian Ocean and to uh, South, South, uh, South China Sea and to, to Guangzhou, then uh, to use the canal to come to Kaifeng. So the question is about the elaborating a little further on the historiography that uh, that structured parts of the argument. So particularly why the history or knowledge of the Kaifeng Jews were variously left out or perhaps appropriated in different ways depending on the perspective of the historians. So it's more of a question of just the historiography. If you wanted to add anything, I think I give my you know last thought on the historiography. One question that, that struck me as really interesting is actually the piece on the on the hoax uh, that, that, that was published in Penslar's uh, yeah. you know, out of Brandeis in 2005, right? Which is a very you know reputable, not just press, but a very significant publication. And so to have that as I mean, a piece dedicated to Jews and I think the Oriental or Orientalism, yeah. and to basically say that it's that it's uh, that they never existed, I understand, or it was a hoax, yeah. is an interesting like why at that moment and the reception in the American you know, context is kind of interesting. I think I was fascinated by fascinated by that topic. You know, you know, the post postmodernists you know, argue everything is invented ex nihilo from nothing, right? You know, but there are some basic truths, for example, basic you know, evidence about this community. If you want to you know explain a way to argue this is a pure invention. You must uh, explain away those, you know, inscriptions, those artifacts. I was so I was shocked. I don't know. I think it's a hoax, hoax, either a hoax against the post-colonial discourse or an intellectual bankruptcy of that discourse. That was my. Let's go on this side. Um, sure. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Uh, James Michener, in his book Hawaii, referred to the Chinese of Asia as the Jews of Asia. And uh, the overlap between the evolution of Chinese society from a warrior culture to a trading, mercantile, intellectually based, respecting a family and uh, and uh, cuisine and and uh, mercantilism, uh, the overlap is so great. So that the tiger moms that people write about, the Chinese mothers and the Jewish mother, the archetypal Jewish mother, there. There's so much similarity, and the uh, the love of the Jewish people for Chinese food, which is <laughs> I have Italian friends who only want to eat Italian restaurants. If you say where will we go out to eat Italian food only, but the Jews are open, just like any American <laughs> culture. Like the Chinese will do business with any society, dictatorship, oppressive, <laughs> intolerant. Their job is to do business, and the Jews to survive, uh, uh, detached from farming and other. Uh, landowning uh, uh, pursuits had to evolve how to live on their brains, on their trading abilities, accepting all cultures, being able to live in 
And the Chinese, like the book 1421 points out, with their trading fleets to Africa, to the Americas, all over the world, they have hundreds and hundreds of years of, uh, of ad adaptation to cultures that they could do business with without any uh, conflict with their intrinsic Chinese. I don't know. I don't know. Probably we should do some gene studies. <laughs> Are there any overlap in genes <laughs> between Jewish and Chinese? Uh, I wanted to get a couple more people who haven't spoken yet. Um, Are there, is there evidence of other cities along the Silk Road that have Jewish communities? Dunhuang, for example, or Samarkand? Samarkand is a very important Jewish entrepreneur on Silk Road, yeah. especially in East, uh, in Central Asia. There are a lot of you know Jewish communities along the Silk Road, and as far as I, as I mentioned in my you know paper, uh, there are two you know uh, documents in Judeo Persia in Xinjiang, in Xinjiang province. Now, uh, obviously, there are a lot of Jewish merchants along the. Uh, Silk Road. Uh, okay. It's just quite a, a little short information question. Uh, you talked about the Jews, you know, doing Torah study. Do we have any information about ritual like Shmira, about Sabbath observance among Kaifa community or ritual observance on the Jewish side? Also, the question that no one is that I'm always curious about. I just said why they might go to Kaifeng when it was capital in Beisung, but after the fall of the Beisung, the capital was to Hangzhou, then to Nanjing, then to Beijing, and they stay there, and nobody else is staying there. So why are they, are there Jews that are also moving to Beijing and to Nanjing and to Linan, or are they all staying in? in uh, why can, there are many no places, for example, according to uh, historical evidence, there are uh, also uh, local Jewish community in Hangzhou, uh, Hangzhou, that's the uh, uh, capital of uh, Southern Beisong, and the Southern Song Dynasty. Yeah. And he, according to an uh, Islamic uh, traveler, uh, Ibn Battuta, you know, he recorded there was a Jewish gate in Jewish gate uh, in the city of Hangzhou. But actually, in Arabic, the Jewish gate means Jewish quarter. You know, that's that's a, that means there's a there was a Kind of uh, ghetto or Jewish Jewish quarter in uh, Hangzhou. Yeah, a lot of in ancient times, also in Nanjing, there there was you know Jew, uh, uh, there were Jews in Nanjing. Yeah. But but the evidence uh, is very scarce. It's very hard to construct uh, a coherent narrative based on these very fragmentary sources. And the first the question is... You know, About Sabbath observance? Oh, ritual. Sabbath. Yeah, ritual, ritual. Uh, as far as I know, uh, a, a professor uh, of Persia uh, at Harvard University published recently you know, a new book on Haggadot of Kaifen. I haven't, you know, you know, had a chance to see that book. It's newly published. Can you do um, you still have a question? It, yeah, mine was also about rabbinical Judaism. Whether it, all we have in terms of physical evidence is, is uh, been referring to the Tanakh and not any other uh, uh, secondary source, important Jewish source. Talmud is very much. No Talmud. No, no, no. But there are Hagadot. Yeah, Hagadot. Hagadot. Yeah. Um, during the Typhoon period, were the Jews that came with the family? Did they bring their wives? Or? No hard evidence for that. But many scholars hypothesis that you know they arrived Typhoon and uh, take the uh, local woman and converted them into Judaism. So that's a main reason that they assimilate. The yeah, Chinese. they are you know physically indistinguishable from other Chinese. I think that's the main reason. We have friends, even nowadays, their the last name is Lan Dan, but the Chinese last name is Lan. <laughs> so the Lan Dan is a Jewish family. 
No, there are seven, uh, seven uh, called surnames of typically Jewish. Gao, Shi, Ai, Jing, Zhang. Li, li Bai is Li Bai or no, Jewish? No, 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 Li Bai is not Jewish. Li Bai is, you know, according, it's Russian. <laughs> it's Turkish. He said it's Turkey. It's ancestry. Ancestry, uh, uh, Russian. He was born in Russia, in today's Russia. Oh. Our national poet. So let's take one more, one more question. Now, why have not been to Zien? Is there any record of Jewish history in Zien? Only because they have, it has a very old and rich Islamic culture there. Yes. There's also a very famous inscription on Nestorians, the, the first Christians in China. The first evidence for you know the spread of Christianity in China. But there's no evidence about Jews in Xi'an. <coughs> to add, when you talk about rituals, that about 20 years ago at the Skirball, they had ketubas in Chinese. Yes. Marriage yes. contract. Uh, that's uh, the ketubas uh, uh, left over by the uh, refugee, the, particularly in modern <coughs> period, in Shanghai, in Tianjin, there were, you know, ketubas in Hebrew and in Chinese, bilingual ketubas. But they are, you know, expats, not for, from the local Asian community. Ones. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk.